allies have been on the Israel-Hamas war for more than six months, and there's also, of course, been the two-year-old war between Russia and Ukraine. But meanwhile, a violent civil war between two armed factions has been ravaging Sudan, with hardly any mention of it in the news. Since turmoil came to a head in this northeastern African nation, 15,000 people have been killed and 8.2 million have been displaced. That's right, 8.2 million people displaced. This makes Sudan the largest displacement crisis in the world. United States Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, addressed the deadly war in Sudan. Here's a little of what she said last Friday. Today, nearly 25 million Sudanese people live in dire need of humanitarian assistance and protection. Three quarters of them face acute food insecurity. Nearly 8 million have had to flee their homes in what has become the world's largest internal displacement crisis. Here to talk about the crisis in Sudan is Alan Boswell, the crisis group's project director for the Horn of Africa, where he oversees uh, organizations' work on Ethiopia, Sudan, South Sudan, and the regional dynamics. Please, welcome to the show, Alan. Can you start by uh, telling us how we got here in the first place? Well, this war broke out a, a year ago, and I think the easiest way of thinking about it is that it's a uh, remnant, in a way, uh, of the. F it's it's a fallout from the dictatorship of Omar al Bashir in Sudan, uh, that was a thirty year rule, um, and he was overthrown by this large protest movement in twenty nineteen. Uh, it was the cause for a lot of hope that there could be a new uh, sort of a new dispensation, even uh, potentially democracy, in Sudan. Um, but uh, the protesters weren't really able to overthrow Bashir by themselves. Uh, actually, his security uh, services stepped in to overthrow him. And then instead of handing over power to civilians, they took power themselves. But they themselves were very divided. Uh, Bashir had done something called coup proofing, um, in which he purposely um, uh, uh, allowed multiple different uh, security uh, services to 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 rise up and become powerful to all counteract each other. This meant uh, that there was sort of a rule by committee that took place um, after he was overthrown. And essentially, the civil war is the two largest of those: the formal army and the biggest of the paramilitary forces in Sudan going at each other in a really nasty power struggle that has now spiraled for over a year, has sucked in a variety of other militias as well as a number of outside regional powers who are arming these two sides. Can you tell us a little about the history of Sudan and uh, the U.S. involvement there? So I know that uh, President Obama uh, touted um, his, his own uh, achievements um, during having relations with that country, but it has all come to naught. Yeah, the U.S. has, uh, maybe to the surprise of many Americans, the U.S. has been a leading actor, if not the lead actor, on Sudan for, for several decades. Um, it was the Clinton administration that first imposed uh, really uh, difficult sanctions on the Bashir regime in the 1990s, um, put it on the state sponsor of terror list. But then it was the George W. Bush administration that really uh, spearheaded uh, peace efforts to try to end what was a long, brutal civil war. That ended up leading to the secession of South Sudan um, in 2011. Um, I was there when South Sudan uh, seceded, and there was a lot of optimism. And Obama officials, because it was the Obama presidency, were patting themselves on the back about uh, that. And throughout all this, you saw, uh, well, especially since the Bush administration, you saw a series of very high-level special envoys who were who are more or less the uh, de facto uh, diplomatic leads on the Sudan file for both Sudan and, and South Sudan after the two split. However, in recent years, we've seen that level of engagement uh, drastically um, reduced in terms of seniority, and it eventually became uh, more or less an ambassadorial file in the U.S. foreign policy system when this war broke out. What is actually the cause of the internal displacement? Is it people fleeing from open combat, um, the actual battle? Uh, is it motivated in part by the uh, food insecurity that Linda Thomas-Greenfield alluded to? What's going on on the ground? 
Uh, well, the the fighting is is uh, the major cause of of the humanitarian crisis. Uh, I mean, it is the cause of the massive humanitarian crisis going right now. It's difficult to describe uh, how bad things are because uh, obviously uh, a lot of eyes of the world are on other bad crises. But you've had a a, a uh, this war started in the capital of Khartoum, which meant that the center of Sudan has collapsed at the beginning of this war. Um, it was a it was a metropolitan area of some. 8 million people, maybe more, maybe 10 million people. Millions of those are still trapped. It's been an active war zone ever since. Food can't get in or out except through smuggling. All the aid groups have left. Uh, meanwhile, the western region of Darfur is also completely war racked, also completely basically cut off from humanitarian uh, assistance as well. And, uh, and, and aid groups are warning that the country is barreling towards a famine that would affect millions of people and possibly something on the scale that uh, that hasn't been seen uh, in, in recent memory. Um, we haven't seen a collapse like this in, in the sort of uh, Northeast Africa uh, region since the collapse of Somalia 30 years ago. I just raise that to say if, if something isn't, if there's not a way to halt to this soon and if there aren't more focused efforts to end this war, we're looking at probably a decades long attempt at rebuilding the state like we have seen in Somalia. And of course, the outcome of that has been a prolonged uh, jihad insurgency and a bunch of other as well as piracy off the um uh off the uh, horn of africa coast and many other long-term uh sort of uh security issues that that plague not only the region but end up being quite a headache for the wider world as well so what is that something uh, what has been the response from other countries in the region from international organizations like the united uh, united nations from the united states at, at other times we recently had a conversation on the show about the turmoil in haiti there have been at times you know maligned but efforts by the international community to pick alternative leadership that may or not be accepted by the people of haiti are there similar efforts to come to some kind of consensus about who could be agreed to as a leader for the country? Is that kind of intervention from international parties welcome in Sudan? Well, uh, there are the internal dynamics in Sudan, which I briefly, briefly outlined before, but this is also now a regional war. You have Egypt very much on the side of the formal army, which controls most of the east of Sudan, including Port Sudan on the Red Sea. And the UAE is the major backer of the Rapid Support Forces, which is the paramilitary force that controls much um, of the western side of the country. And Saudi Arabia is basically a neighbor of Sudan. It sits just, just across the Red Sea. And uh, they have a, Saudi Arabia has a lot of leverage over both of these two warring parties. Um, so the only major power that looks like it can really corral not only the internal but these external actors looks like the U.S. Uh, Crisis Group, uh, the organization I work for, has been very openly disappointed in the Obama administration's response to this. Uh, the U.S. Um, leading up to this war was the major uh, leading actor on Sudan and uh, and and historically has been. Um, uh, but it wasn't just because it was uh, distracted by Gaza. Gaza broke out six months after the war in Sudan had already started and we did not see a high level response from the US. It wasn't until February that we finally saw the Biden administration appoint a special envoy to really spearhead efforts. Uh, it was something we had called for since the first weeks of the war. Um, and now that special envoy, Tom Perriello, a former congressman from Virginia, um, you know, he, he's, he's brought uh, a lot more energy on the file and is doing this high level shuttle diplomacy uh, within the broader region in the Arab world that was obviously needed to win this conflict. It's just unfortunate that he uh, essentially got a 10-month-old uh, uh, late start. Mm. Alan, thank you so much for joining us today to fill us in on what's going on. We really appreciate it. Thank you for covering this.